Autumn is well and truly here. Morning everybody. If you're new around here, we're in the middle of converting this Sainsbury's delivery van into a winter camper. Because we're planning to take it to the Arctic this winter. However, this morning we are seriously questioning our decision. <laughs> it's not even that cold and we're freezing. <laughs> we're freezing. We're hoping though that she's going to keep us nice and warm because she used to be a refrigerated delivery van. So the insulation should keep us toasty and warm in the Arctic. So let's get cracking. Let's do this. Now don't tell John, but this is a cordless tool I can get on board with him having. Cordless heat gun for the win. So the first big job of the day is electrics and I'm not going to get it finished today, I just want to get the units bolted on the wall. And I have had a few people ask if I could go into this thoroughly but to be honest, to go through it all properly is probably about a 20 minute video to say about it all. So at the minute we can't really do that just because we just haven't got the time. So what I'm going to do is hopefully when we get back from Africa, um, I'm going to start my own channel and do a lot more reviews and a lot more like tutorials on just one subject. But one man I would say to go look at if you want a full-on review of stuff like this is Greg Virgo. He's really good, really, really thorough, and I've learned a lot from him myself. So yeah, head over to his channel and have a look. But what we're gonna do today is, so this is where my fridge is gonna be, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install all the electrics on the back wall here. So we can always pull the fridge out to get to it, but hopefully once you install all your electrics, you should never have to get to it and do anything with it. So that's what we're gonna do. So another handy little tool to get is when you're doing camper conversions is a set of these crimpers and some ferrules, some wire ferrules. Because when you're doing in household electrics, obviously it's normally just a single core cable. And when you screw into like your socket and that, you get a real good fixing. Well obviously on campers you run flexi cable and there's all different like multi strands. So when you screw into this socket, it just splays it everywhere and you don't really get a good contact. So all you do is you get these ferrules, you just go over the wire like that, and then you get your some crimpers, and you crimp it up, and then when you screw it into your socket, you get a real good contact and a fixing. Let's make some drawers. Running wild, nothing to lose. Do you remember the innocence of you? Butterflies and summer skin, lightning. Exploding through She fits Roller coasters in Draw two fits ah, Bugger Ah, bugger, bugger, bugger This is perfect, Johnny boy I'm impressed with that Three for three Get in So one broken back and one day later But she's all in Now, I filmed a little bit of it But it wasn't that good Because it's a bit tight in there But I'll show you what I got See what I mean? There was a few choice words chucked about the place yesterday. There's a reason I stayed in the shed yesterday. Yeah, the old winker <laughs> stayed well out of it. Winker? Did everybody notice Jess's wink last week? Shut <laughs> <laughs> She can't wink. Let me show you. It's brilliant. Absolute brilliant, eh? Shut up and show me the electrics. Let me show you the electrics. So it might look a bit messy because you can see all the wires and everything, but it's the most practical way of doing it. And because the fridge is going in, I didn't need to tuck it all behind boards and everything like that. So all I've got is the consumer unit, the 240 volt charger, I've got the 1000 watt inverter, and then I've got a Renergy DC-DC MPPT controller, and that's the 50 amp version. And then down here is the 200 amp hour lithium battery. So what I've done with that as well is I've put it on three slats. So it's off the floor, because thanks to Alex Froude, he was saying that if you have it on the floor, it creates like a cold bridge, uh, but obviously you want to keep your battery warm uh, so it charges. And if you notice this cabinet, I've done it in like two 
it's two stages, so I'll get Jess to explain why. So, we've only gone for 200 amp hours of lithium, and that's for a couple of reasons really. First is, we've never even come close to using all of our battery power before, and we move most days, so even though we're not going to get a huge amount of sunlight where we're going, we should still be good on power. We also have very low consumption of power in terms of the things that we use, and the only thing we use on 240 volt is to charge our laptops. But John has left a space in there so that if we get up there and we're struggling, we can add another battery in. He's even put all the wires and stuff. But we didn't want to spend another £650 for something that we might not even use. The other bit of insurance that we've put in is we've put in a 240 volt charger. So if there's a blizzard coming or something and we're a bit worried that we might not have enough power, we can pull up our campsite, plug in, and we know that we'll have enough power to keep the diesel heater running and the lights on. So the last bit to all the electrics is I've cut a little doorway in here and we're going to put a door on there and this is where all the 12 volt fuses are and all the isolated trips and everything like that so we can isolate all the power. Then we've got a 240 volt switch here to turn the inverter on and then we've got the 12 volt switches and then the switch for the steps. Imagine the steps going out here. And then I put a little LED on there so we know when the steps are out. But the last bit of advice I can give you is to go through the floor with the cables, you obviously want to seal tight it so none of the cold air and that's coming through. So what I've done, a bit of plastic pipe, it's a bit of plumbing pipe, a bit of 40 mil, and then I've got an old inner tube, just put that over it, and then obviously it's a lot tighter there, but it will expand depending on how many cables you put through. And obviously if it's a bit tight, just chuck a bit of talcum powder in there. So this morning I'm getting on with making the doors and drawer fronts and I've got John in helping me, one because it's raining and he's a wimp and two because the piece of wood behind me cost a hundred pound for one sheet so I don't want to mess these cuts up. So let's talk about the doors. So this is going to be the bathroom door and what we're going to go with is we're going to go with shaker style doors. Obviously when you have your rails around the outside and the ball recessed in the middle. So but rather than do it where we cut the strips and screw it all together for the bathroom door, because it's so big and we don't want it to warp or anything like that, we're going to try and keep it as one piece. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut out the squares with my favourite track saw and then we're going to uh, tack a 6mm board to the back and that will give us a shaker style and then we can reuse these bits that we cut out the middle for the other doors. <laughs> We have a door. Looks a bit more pimp than just a little stripy door. I reckon we should just leave it like this. Jesus, John, I do not want to see you on the loo through that anymore. Just have, have a panel in behind and leave the top so you could be like, we could be, I could pop my head out our way no, through. I want it there so I can shut the door and get away from you. We have a door. Now, I know some cabinet makers will be looking at this and thinking, oh my God, what have they done? But this is, for us, the strongest, quickest, easiest, straightest way of doing it. So, and the thickness, it will make a lot more sense when I show you the frame. But for now, we've got a lightweight door. So whilst Jess is on her tea break, I'm going to bring you part one of Tool Talk Tuesday because we're doing two parts this week, seeing as though she stole my thunder last week. And this week, we're going to review the Craig Jig. Now, you've seen us use this loads, and we've uh, talked about it loads, but I haven't actually shown you what it is, so let me show you. So this is your Craig Jig, just the blue bit. That's all you get when you buy it. And all I've done is I've made this other little jig to go in it and screwed it to it. So when you're doing longer pieces like that, it's uh, got a bit of support as well, so you can do it on your own. But what you do is you get this little drill bit here, which has got like a little pilot hole in the middle, and then obviously the flat edge there. And then what you do is you set that up to what board thickness you're cutting. So as you can see here, that's set to 16 mil. And then on the side here as well, you set your, your thickness of your board on there as well. So I've got them both set to 16 mil. And then obviously I've got a bit of 15 mil ply here, the birch ply. And look how beautiful that is for a start. Look at them lovely patterns, but that's the way it's done the Craig. And all you do is you drop your bit of wood in there, you clamp it up, and then you just obviously drill in there and that's what gives you the little screw holes like that. I've had a few people ask me as well how I do 12 mil because if you set this to 12 mil and try and jig at 12 mil, it won't work. They either, they're a bit proud on here or they come out the other end. So what I do is for a start, 
you use these screws. These are pan head screws. Make sure you get them 25 mil long, not these sort of screws with a big flat washer head. And then set your jig, your drill bit up to 16 mil. And also your board thickness, set that to 16 as well, even though you're doing 12. I don't know why it doesn't do it on the 12. Maybe you can get a, long, a shorter screw, but I've looked and yeah, I just can't get it to do it. But if you're doing 18, 19, 35, any other thicknesses, do it to what it recommends. But when you do 12, set it to 16 and you won't have a problem. So we nearly finished doing the doors, but one other tool I just wanted to quickly show you is this, it's called a Craig clamp as well. So obviously when we're screwing this together, you want both surfaces to be the same height. So all you do is clamp it up and then when you screw it in, it keeps it level. And then another thing I like to do as well, while the glue's still wet, is just get some of your sawdust from where you've been cutting and then just rub it in the gaps. Just a nice little wood filler. And when you cut your six mil board as well to go on your frame, leave it ever so slightly bigger. Don't try and get it exact. Cause then what you do is you get this router bit with a little ball bearing end on it. And what that does is it follows the door frame all the way around and then it will just trim off the excess. So then the door will be exact both sides. Morning everyone. So we've had a special delivery. Rhodes Vans have kindly sponsored this video and they sponsor us a set of springs because if you know anything about sprinters, you know they're a bit rocky and this is even worse. So obviously when they build them, they try and build them as cheap as possible and as lightweight as possible to try and get the most payload. And this has only got a single leaf spring on the rear. So like I say, when the wind's going here, like it rocks like mad. When we're getting in and out, it's real bad and driving's even worse. So when I first got it, I thought we might have to upgrade the suspension, but I was hoping when we put more weight in it, it would settle down a bit. So we've got to come up with a plan to try and show you how this is a bit rocky. So I've had two ideas. One is a drive, and the other I need a trusty little assistant for. Can you guess who that'll be? My lovely Jessica. Can you help me out with a, a little project I've got on the go? Gonna have to, aren't I? So I've thought of a way we can test it. We can obviously drive it and see what it's like like that. But really, you want to test it with an activity you do in the van. Not that often, I'll give you that, but um, every now and again, shall we say. So we'll do that one first. You ready? Yes, darling, I'm so excited. I'll be back in 20. Nice 20 minute session there. 20 seconds of our life. <laughs> got a bit of a stitch. So that's the first session out of the way, but we've got to carry it on later. We've got to do another one. Thanks Rose Vans, two in one day. Let's get the driving done. So everybody knows that on sprinters, the body roll is quite bad anyway, but on these it's even worse because you think of a normal panel van where your floor is probably about half a meter lower because on this one, obviously you've got your chassis rails running through, then you've got your C channel, then you've got your box on top. So your center of gravity is a lot higher on this compared to normal panel vans. So I've actually had a few different types of suspension on the rear axle of vans. So I've had a five ton spring on an old sprinter I had, so it was a twin leaf. And then I've also had uh, airbags that I fitted to a transit as well. And they're brilliant, I really like them. But the problem with it is, is you, you lift your back end up and you get your back end all nice and you do nothing to your front. So you're almost in a way making it worse. So this is why I've gone with these. These are sumo springs and these are the super springs. And basically this spring here just bolts onto the top of your original leaf spring on your rear suspension. And then it just acts as like a helper spring and it's adjustable in three positions as well. So depending what load you're running, you can adjust it to suit. And then they fit these. And these are the sumo springs. And these basically just go in where your original bump stops are. And 
these are the front ones. So this is why I wanted to fit them because then you're doing something to your front end. So obviously we're gonna lift it up and also stiffen it up as well. So real easy to fit, uh, but basically they're just a polyurethane and they're progressive spring. So as it compresses, they get strong, like stiffer basically. So let's get them fitted. So what I like about this kit is this is all the tools you need to fit them. And this is how easy it is to fit the sumo springs. So that's your original one. You just pull that bad boy off and then you just slot this one in at the front like that. And then just get either a set of big uh, uh, clamps or you could do it with a big screwdriver but I find this is an easier way to do it. And you just squeeze it in and then she's in. And now the super springs. So all you do is fit this little rubber block to the bottom of the spring and put the clamp over it. And then just slot your spring in. And this is the adjustable bit here. So you can have it on one, two or three, depending on what you want. We're going for the stiffest. And then all you gotta do is wind this G clamp down to get the back end in. And then you just put your back bolt in. And then all this does is just rolls on the spring as it moves. So basically now it's a twin leaf spring suspension, but it's adjustable as well. So that's why I like that. And now let's fit the front. And then this one's even easier. So this little bump stop here, that's the original one. There's a little nut on the top. So you undo that. And then that's the difference between the new one and the old one. So bin that, and then you just slot that one in there, do the nut up, job done. So it's giving it about one inch lift, front and rear, but let's see how it drives. So I don't know what I'm more impressed with. The fact that the body roll is gone, the fact that he sent me this beautiful t-shirt, so it's doubled my wardrobe range, or the bungee he sent me. And I'm gonna put this to good use in our next test. Are you ready, Jess? Well, she's stiffened up a bit. Oh she's a God. good ride <laughs> and she takes a good rocking. I said rocking. I'm sorry, Dad. Um, if you guys are interested in getting in Sumo Springs, hit up Rhodes Vans, because for the next four weeks, they've given us a discount code that will give you 10% off. So you just need to put in TBT10 at the checkout. Now, where are we going to put this bungee? In the bloody garage. Love a bungee. <laughs> <laughs> So do you remember how we told you that we like making inset doors because they're easy and they look nice? Well they are and they do if you measure them right. But we've made all of the doors 4mm too bloody small. <laughs> so we spent all of yesterday afternoon having to remake them again because that is just not on point enough. But we've got them all done and we've got the red room set up so I'm going to get my guns out and get painting. So before I get on with the painting I wanted to show you a little trick that we use for painting doors. And we do this whether we're spray painting or rollering. And it means that you can paint both sides in one go. You don't have to wait for them to dry. So you just remember to do it on the bottom of your door. All you have to do is just drill a couple of pilot holes with a small drill bit. And then you get some of these picture hooks that have got a screw on the end. And you just screw them in. So put two on so they sit nicely. And then John's made me a little rack here, a bit of wire. So once they're painted, you can just hang them up and leave them to dry. So last week I started with all the plumbing and I want to try and get as much done as I can today. So obviously we've shown you that we've got the water heater of the night here in there and then I've ducted that into the bathroom and then it's going to come out the side of the seat here. I've got all my wiring in there as well which is going to run through the water pump, the filter, the night heater and everything like that. And obviously I've piped it all up. So I've got the bullfinch shower in there and the reason we use that rather than a normal shower is because then we can unclip it 
and then take the hose out of the way so you haven't got to clam around the like the shower fitting and we really like these and you can get this off ebay it's eight quid and it's real good because you've got a stop start button on it as well and you can change all the the spray as well so really recommend them but the pipes we use so i use 15 mil jg speed fit just like household stuff and I've tried that and the, the 12 mil before, like the normal uh, blue stuff, and you don't really notice any pressure difference. And the reason I use the, the 15 mil is just because I stock it for like house stuff and things like that, and it's a lot cheaper than the, the blue stuff. It isn't as flexible, so you have to use more couplings, so it probably works out about the same anyway, really, but I just prefer it anyway, so that's what we've gone with. And then we're going to go with a 100 litre tank underneath the, the double passenger seat here. And I've done the same on that as I have done the batteries. I've put slats underneath just to keep it off the floor, to keep some airflow around it, stop it freezing. And then also I've put vents in every cupboard that I've got. We've put vents in the bottom, so in the garage, in the, uh, the wardrobe, everywhere. So then hopefully we can keep the airflow and the temperature all over the van about the same temperature. So this is our water pump and filtration system. So we run a Sureflow pump and a Seaflow accumulator. Obviously make sure you put your pre-filter on your pump. And we run the accumulator because if you run the water at low pressure, it quite often pulsates, whereas this stops that problem. And this is our water filtration system. So I made this with the help of a guy called John at Direct Fort Water Filters, highly recommend them. And it was because we wanted a system to go in the Defender. And if you don't know, we're taking it to Africa. So we needed to make sure our water is super, super safe, but also we didn't have a huge amount of space to put the filtration system in. And when I was looking, the systems I found were like a thousand pounds, whereas this comes to about 220. So first part of it is this UD PAC filter. And this gets rid of 99% of your bad guys. So it gets rid of all your heavy metals, most of your bacteria and stuff like that. But to get rid of the smallest nasty, smallest vi uh, virus that makes you poorly, you need a filter that's 0 0.017 of a micron. And to try and push water through a physical filter that's that size, it's like pushing water through a stone. So you lose all of your pressure. So what you do is you use this one first and then it goes into your UV filter. And this is a 12 volt system as well. Um, and it's got a flow switch on it so it doesn't waste battery when it's not in use. And that kills everything. But it is important that you run this one first to get all of the big particles out because otherwise they can block the light from killing off the nasties. So I got the second coat of paint on the cupboards last night and John got all of the plumbing finished and we were really hoping in this episode that we'd get the doors on for you and the plumbing and water fully running. But it's now midday on Friday and this video comes out at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning and I still need to edit it. So I'm really sorry but we're going to have to leave you there for this Whoa! week. <laughs> what are you doing? You nearly did it again! Did what? You nearly stole my thunder again. What time is it? Midday Friday. Triple tea time. You've already done one this we're week. We're having two because you stole my thunder oh, last week. Sake. And this week, we're going for fun till Friday. Oh, just stop. Friday. <laughs> so I've had a lot of questions about the lift we use to take the body off the Sprinter. Now, all it is is a two-poster car lift. And it's not made for outside, but I made it work outside. So there's not much to these car ramps. Obviously, you can see the legs at the bottom. They're out to the weather, but I just grease them up every now and again. But the main bit you want to keep dry is the, the middle part, the column. And what I've done is I've made a frame for it and then a cover to go over it. So let me show you. So that's the cover I had made. But I got that made after I made the frame. So the frame's just some 45 by 45 angle and it covers the whole column. And then what I've done is I've bolted it to the bottom part. So then when you go up with the ramp, all the frame and the cover and everything go up. But then it keeps all this column inside nice and protected from the weather. So all I do once a year is pull the cover off 
and then spray all inside here so that keeps it nice and uh, nice and clean and then the bottom part that's exposed to the elements I just paint that up once a year as well and then normally you've got a control box on the side to control the ramp well what I've done is I've just made a little box little waterproof box for that to go in and then I can control it from there and yeah that's how I made the ramp work while he's preoccupied and I can tell you guys the truth about him he hasn't just got one ramp Oh no, 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 he's got two. There's another one hidden inside of the shed. Some of you eagle-eyed people have noticed. And has that ever been used for a car or what it was made for, John? I used it once. Once, one bloody time. He said to me about getting this one because he's now turned that one into mezzanine storage to go up and down to get things, right? He said, if we get this one, then I'll fix your cars like that. Anytime there's a problem, no worries because I haven't got to get it all off the ramp, right? I am so bloody gullible. My car has been sat in this very spot for a month with a broken clutch. We had to push it out to do this segment for you guys. Why is that, John? <laughs> Let me show you the other app. Oh my God. So this is the four poster ramp. It's the same brand as the other one, Automotec, Automotec? Bloody no. Automotech, I think, but they're really good brand. Um, really like them. Quite cheap for what they are, but <laughs> I, I actually bought this one to use genuinely, but there's just not quite enough space around it. And I thought a two poster would be ideal. And you've got to admit, the two posters come in good for the old campers. It has, John, but the shed's already bigger than our house. So all I do is I just use a bit of storage up there. I've got the bikes on there, so then I can put stuff under there. And then when I need to get to that stuff as well, I can just drop that down and use that. My second wrap. We'll see you next week. See you next week.